Uh, and uh, my name is Prasenjit Dwara. I am the director of the Asia Research Institute of NUS. So please come up and sit up here in the second row or first row. Um, and uh, I uh, am, we are, the Asia Research Institute has co-sponsored this event together with uh, the Nalanda Shivaja Center, which is uh, at the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies. And uh, it has been, of course, hosted by the Asian Civilization Museum, which has been gracious enough to lend us this large theater. And, um, and I, before I say anything else, I want to uh, uh, give my thanks to Valerie Yo of RE, who is the leader of our events management team, all of whom have been, some of whom are here and here, and uh, they have been working tirelessly on these, uh, for these events that we are uh, sponsoring uh, with the visit of uh, Dr. Amitav Ghosh, and we feel indeed very fortunate to have him here in Singapore. Apparently he's not such a stranger to Singapore, apart from writing about it, those of you who have read River of Smoke will recall bits. Uh, he also comes here once in a while. But uh, I think since the beginning of the Ibis Trilogy, this is probably his first uh, visit. And uh, so my role in this is, uh, from now on, very limited. It is basically I wrote the, the questions in the proposal that you see uh, for the describing what this event is supposed to be, and I'm not sure if the speakers will speak to those questions or not. Maybe at least tangentially they will refer to them. But uh, the reason, and this is doing a little propaganda for Ari, in case you want to know more about Ari, I usually give a long introduction to Ari, but uh, you can just look it up in the website because we don't have time to do that here now. Uh, but um, I thought that uh, Ari is very concerned with certain issues, especially the rise of Asia, the crisis of sustainability, and the role of arts. So I plan to just make three very short uh, Singapore-style comments uh, to sort of just uh, establish uh, the themes that, that we are invest interested in having our speakers uh, investigate. I think by now almost everybody is agreed that the center of economic activity has moved or is moving rapidly to Asia. Um, and in case you're not, I have a few statistics that I picked up from the World uh, Trade Organization report. Since 2002, China's share in East Asian trade has leapt from 10% to 23% while the share of the U.S. trade in the same period has gone in exactly the other direction, I'm quoting, from 23% to 10%. Moreover, in places like in Indonesia and, and India, India, the Indian growth story, of course, is now in the doghouse. Uh, but the latest WTO report still shows that the fastest growing exports, although from a much lower base, are not from China, but India at 16% in 2011-2012, whereas China is 9% and the US is 7%. Imports are also actually similar, not so different, uh, the narrative that we give. So that's, so that's the first point, right? That there has been a shift in the center of economic gravity. The second thing, which doesn't necessarily follow, but is very important, is that this is a very, the growth in Asia in particular is a very interdependent one. And uh, a lot of it has to do with supply chain production, uh, you know, single products assembled in different parts of Asia and so on. And if you look at it now, already you're beginning to see that more Asian economies, including the Indian economy, is tracking the running peak more than it is tracking the, the dollar. So those are, I think, very interesting developments. And thirdly, of course, uh, uh, following from this is that Economic growth is, is not just a story of celebration. It is accompanied by many political problems, as we all know, sitting in Singapore. 
And, but most of all for me, it is contributing to an unsustainable environmental crisis at both the regional and global levels. So it is in this context, I think, that the rise of Asia must find different ways to build um, uh, new ways to build, to cooperate, and indeed transcend attitudes uh, generated by the uncompromising sovereignty of nation states in order to be able to uh, address these issues, which are not limited to nations. You do need to go. You need to be able to see what's happening in another nation so that it doesn't affect your waters and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then, you know, it's unusual to think of the arts. You usually think of politics or political politics or economics or something to address these issues. But it seems to me that the arts also have a very important role in creating identities, in in producing how people think of themselves and how they think of the most important entities around them. And so this, is, uh, this was my thought. How can we begin to even begin to think of the role of arts in this context? And I thought that there was, in, in, with, this mind, in, with this in mind, I posed these questions to the panelists. And I thought uh, Amitabh, who has, uh, Dr. Ghosh, who has worked on so many of these areas, uh, will be both as, a, as an anthropologist, as a historian, and of course as a writer, uh, would be in a very well place to do so, to speak on them. And uh, we also have a very uh, stunning group of uh, other scholars, uh, many of whom are interested uh, in Ghosh's work, but are also working on uh, important issues in their own areas. And I will read, uh, and I have to apologize uh, for Professor Gayatri Spiva, who at the last minute could not make the event. Uh, there's a good reason for it. She has been awarded the Kyoto Prize uh, for, uh, for Philosophy and the Arts, which is a very major prize. And she has to spend a long time in Kyoto. And that's uh, a very important part of the reason why she couldn't make it at the end, but we certainly congratulate her on that prize. Um, so, but our um, other speakers will be introduced by our moderator, who is none other than NUS, Yale NUS's uh, Professor Rajiv Patke, who is the Director of Humanities at Yale NUS. And uh, as uh, many of you know, he is certainly the most polished uh, moderator that we can find in Singapore. And uh, we're very grateful to have him here. So I'll give him the, uh, the podium. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Prasunji. Uh, those are tough words to live up to. But the hot seat is not mine, so I really am not to worry. We have a distinguished panel. And I'd like to congratulate all of you for being here because I have two general points to make by way of introduction. One is that the arts involve more than the mere practice. They involve cultural literacy. And this is where our panel is very strong. I come from India where there's a long tradition of rich cultural productions in all the art forms, particularly say dance or music. And it's one of the most amazing things that has been a matter of enormous irritation to me that almost none of the musicians I talked with could talk intelligibly about music. They could sing wonderfully, they could perform wonderfully, but as soon as they stopped performing and started talking, you wished you hadn't asked them to speak. <laughs> so the enormous importance of literacy about the practice of the arts. My other two points are actually quite simple. We have three lines of convergence, Asia, the 20th century, and the arts. Now, some of you may have read Dickens. One of Dickens' later novels, I think it's our mutual friend, begins more or less like this, and I paraphrase. Now that Mr. and Mrs. Vineer had some money, they decided to acquire some polish. <laughs> now, often we worry in Singapore that now that the Southeast has money, it has decided to, what shall we say, subsidize the arts. Okay. Now, that's the cynical view. I'll give a different perspective. In 1939, the great Irish poet William Butler Yeats died. 
And another great poet, W. H. Auden, wrote an elegy. And in that elegy he said, something I'm going to paraphrase, he was speaking of poetry, but it really refers to all the arts. He said, poetry exists in the valley of its saying, where executives do not stray. <laughs> now, transpose the point, often it is felt the arts exist on the margins of real life. Real life is about making money, about becoming prosperous. Where do the arts exist? Consider Shakespeare. If he had not lived, what would have happened? The British Council would have collapsed. <laughs> there would be a whole bunch of theatre companies which would have to go looking for other playwrights. A few academics would be without PhDs and jobs, and just as well. <laughs> so, are the arts important? It's not our speakers alone that are going to say so. It is your interest in coming here, where you could be doing other better things, that you decided this is worth attending. Not just to look at people, not to read their books, which of course you should do, because they are even more impressive in their books than in person, if I may say so. <laughs> Although, I'm sure they will be angry about the claim, and claim quite the contrary, but the point is this, that it is you who make such events important. And what is the case is that the arts are not insignificant. But we need to be aware why they are not. We need to know what it is that justifies the otherwise somewhat irritating use of the word renaissance to refer to whatever is happening in Southeast Asia. <laughs> we are sick to death of hearing of it. But do remember what it involved was people with power making decisions about the arts. What it involved was lots of money, and we mustn't scoff at money, and a lot of energy of the creative kind, which was also of the articulate kind. So today's occasion, and we have to <coughs> congratulate the Asian Museum for hosting this, Prasenjit and his team, and the Asian Research Institute for thinking of such an event, and to thank our distinguished speakers for being here because you're going to listen to them. The time is going to be short. Uh, we are sorry that Gayatri is not here, but we are quite secretly glad she's not. <laughs> because it gives the ones who are here slightly more time. <laughs> so what's going to happen is, we are going to speak each for about 20, 25 minutes. A completely polite, well-disguised individual in the front rank is going to quietly flash a card of a particularly noticeable color when they are five minutes past their time. A slightly more colorful, more agitated wave of a second card will occur two minutes later. And a kind of fierce intervention will occur finally from me in the form of me popping up and saying something intemperate. Thank you. <laughs> so the idea is simply, it's not that we don't want to hear each of our wonderful speakers for longer than we have time for, it's simply we mustn't make too much of a good thing. We do want discussion, we do want conversation, you're not just here as passive listeners, you're here to engage our speakers in conversation, so we do need to create time for that. So time management is of the essence. Now I'll introduce our first speaker. The usual cliché applies here too, our speaker needs no introduction. So I'll take half a minute introducing him anyway. <laughs> He's a distinguished novelist. I hope some of you honestly can say you have read more than one of his novels. Uh, he's working I think on his 10th or 11th. And uh, he has the wonderful ability to combine and move between different worlds. The worlds of journalism, the worlds of academia, and the world of real people where academics sometimes lose touch with reality. So busy they are inculcating students and surviving in their careers. So Amitabh Ghosh has moved not only in terms of profession, vocation, but also in terms of cultures and civilizations. He's one of those rare novelists who is not confined to a region, to a particular set of habits, customs, sensibilities. He's a student of anthropology, of sociology, of culture, of language, of history, of politics, and of people. So, without further ado, I'll invite him to address us for the next 25 minutes to half an hour. Please welcome him.
uh, Matt Pacenti, who was actually my teacher in college a long, long time ago, when he uh, in, uh, said that I had to speak on a panel, I was so stricken by panic that I started writing, and I wrote and wrote and wrote. So I'm going to just cut myself short when I get uh, to 25 minutes and I see cards flashing. <coughs> uh, this, uh, this piece is called The Mystic Mountain, Parables of Culture and Climate Change in Asia. Many of us in Asia have arrived today at a strangely luminous moment when the fabric that joins our past, present, and future is revealed to be a membrane of shimmering, silken fragility. It's as if we were the erstwhile inhabitants of a cluster of warring villages, high in the Himalaya. Overlooking the valley in which we lived was an immense snowy mountain whose peak was always wreathed in clouds. Despite our differences, we held this mountain in common veneration. Our ancestors told us that it was like no other mountain, that it had saved the world from a great deluge. The flood had receded as it rose, and this was what had made our valley habitable. They said the mountain's face was hidden in a veil of clouds because it did not wish to behold us, and for that reason no human foot was ever to be laid upon its slopes. We heeded our ancestors and kept away from this mountain. It, did not, it didn't cross our minds to set foot on it. Life in our valley wasn't easy. We had to toil for our food, and when we weren't doing that, we were at war with our neighbors. But there were compensations, stories most of all. We loved to tell stories, and inevitably, many of these were about our sacred mountain. Then one day, a band of strangers arrived. And since they were from far away, our mountain had no special meaning for them. They set off to do what none of us had ever contemplated. They decided to scale it. We were taken by surprise and tried to hold them off. But our efforts were unavailing. Some of the villagers were defeated in battle, and others were reduced to quiescence with potions that sent them into dreamlike trances. Once we had been subjugated, the strangers appointed armed guards to keep watch over us. These guards were small in number, but they made up for this by conjuring up terrifying illusions of omnipotence. They created such a distance between themselves and us that it was as if they were a different species of being. These armed guards were essential to the assault on the peak, for it was they who ensured that the climbers had enough provisions and porters for their venture. Without these supplies, which we provided, the ascent would have been impossible. And so it happened that we became the suppliers who made it possible for the strangers to conquer our, sac our own sacred mountain. Under the guard's watchful eyes, we toiled in the fields to produce the materials that were needed for the assault. This was our place, we were told. This was where we belonged. Our bodies were not suited to the climb. We were not strong enough. Our diets were enfeebling. Our habits degenerate. Our beliefs perverse our minds weak, and our hearts lacking in courage. Many of us came to believe these things, but there were also many who were not particularly interested. Let the strangers do what they wanted, they said. They would be dealt a just punishment by the mountain itself. And there were many also who didn't care. Life is not about climbing mountains, they said. There are other more important things in the world. And yet the mountain remained and our eyes were drawn inexorably to the climbers as they ascended its mysterious, glistening snows. We walked spellbound as they rebelled upwards in a thin line. We saw that their eagerness to ascend was such that they often fought amongst themselves. We saw that many among them were mutinous, unwilling to continue the climb, and we saw to our horror that these rebels were often hurled off the slopes. And all these dramatic and murderous episodes made the spectacle even more compelling. The lives of the climbers seemed infinitely more exciting than our own dull existences down in the valley. And in no small measure was the attraction enhanced by the fact that our armed guards were always telling us, don't look in that direction. As time went by, our attitude towards the mountain began to change. The reverence we had always held it in slowly shifted away from the mountain and attached itself instead to the spectacle of the climb. Gradually, as the spectacle took the place of sacredness, <coughs> that the mountain had once occupied in our hearts, we burned to ascend those slopes ourselves. Some of the valley's inhabitants witnessed the ascent more closely than the rest. They were the porters, the muleteers, the shepherds, And the stories they told us about the mountain further inflamed our appetites. These porters were the sons of our headmen, the strongest, most intelligent men of our villages. 
it came naturally to us to believe them and obey them. And nor did those who chose to defy them have an easy time of it, for the headmen were ruthless in enforcing their will. Those who asked questions were summarily shoved out of their villages or even put to death. Slowly, at the urging of our headmen and their sons, we began to defy the armed guards, timidly at first, but then with increasing determination. As time went by, our confidence grew and the balance began to dip in the other direction. We realized that we were many and they were few. We learned that we could seriously hinder the climbers by downing our tools and refusing to do what was expected of us. We even won a few skirmishes and battles. And at last, a day came when it became clear to the armed guards that it would be impossible for them to sustain the illusion of omnipotence for much longer. Nor did they need the toilers of the valley as much as they once had, because their fellow climbers had found great stocks of resources frozen on the mountain slopes. These were more than enough for them to sustain themselves. One night, the guards melted away and went racing off to join those who were ahead of them. Now began a tumultuous, headlong race towards the mountain, and only after we had flung ourselves on it, in a mad, breathless rush, did it become clear that we could not all attempt the climb together. No less than the climbers who preceded us would we need toilers to labor at the foot of the slope, patiently sending supplies to those of us who were to attempt the ascent. The realization set in motion a great upheaval in the valley, with some villagers attacking each other in the hope of turning them into drudges. Other villages were torn apart with neighbors killing each other in the hope of getting ahead. A great orgy of bloodletting filled our valley, bringing slaughter and destruction on a scale far beyond that which the armed guards had inflicted on us in the past. So it went on until some kind of order came about, and a great number of the valley's inhabitants were successfully confined to the bottom of the slope, under the guns of newly formed legions of armed guards picked from our own villages. In some villages, the toilers were those who had always been among the poorest. In some, new people succeeded in rising to the top, displacing the old headmen and their sons. But in all cases, they vastly outnumbered those who were chosen for the ascent. And now began another assault upon the mountain, more carefully planned than those that had preceded it. The climb was harder now, because the party ahead had dirtied the slope and turned the resources of the mountain into acres of waste. But despite the difficulties, we persisted. And it soon became evident that we were by no means unequal to the task ahead. Our bodies were strong and our minds sharp. Our hearts were full of courage and our resolve was steadfast. Faster and faster we climbed, and down in the valley the toilers worked harder and harder too, for we had promised them that if they worked hard enough, they too would be allowed to join the ascent. This was the hope that sustained them. Our ascent was spectacular, performed in a much shorter time than the climbers before us had taken. Much sooner than we had expected, the higher slopes came into view, and we now realized, to our astonishment, that the other climbers were faltering and hadn't yet reached the mountain's cloud-wrapped summit. We understood also that if we continued at the pace we had set so far, we might achieve something we had never allowed ourselves to contemplate. Some of us might be among the first to reach the summit. A great upsurge of euphoria seized us now, and for a moment, exhilarated and exhausted, we paused to catch our breath before launching the final assault. And as we stood there, thumping each other on the back and beating our chests with joy, it came to our notice that a few amongst the other climbers were signaling desperately in our direction, urging us to look down at the foot of the mountain. Turning our heads, we beheld a sight that took us utterly by surprise. We saw that the combined weight of the climbing parties had unsettled the snow on the lower slopes of the mountain. As a result, a series of devastating landslides and avalanches had swept through our valley, killing vast numbers of our fellow villagers. We stood there aghast, watching in horror, but there was nothing to be done. To turn back was impossible now. Nor would the villagers below have allowed us to turn back, even if we had been so inclined, for their only hope of survival was to follow us up the mountain. We put our dead kin out of our minds. They were poor anyway and there were so many of them that a few would not be missed. We gathered our resolve once again and threw, and threw ourselves on the slopes with redoubled fury, climbing ever harder and faster. And as we ascended, we noticed that some of the climbers in the party ahead were signaling, signaling again, not pointing downwards this time, but towards the mountain itself. This puzzled us, and we began to tap and probe as we climbed. We saw that strange crevasses were opening beneath our feet, 
that each step was setting off a mudslide. Some of us even fell into the chasms, dying in horrible ways. But still we kept going until suddenly there was a moment of epiphany. All at once we understood what our forefathers had meant when they said that this mountain was not like any other. We realized that it was not a mountain at all, but an iceberg of titanic dimensions formed from the waters of the great deluge. It was because the iceberg had drunk up the waters of our valley, the waters that our valley had emerged from the flood. We remembered then what our grandmothers, grandmothers had said, that it was best to stay away from the mountain, for it would not suffer itself to be climbed by all the people in the valley. We understood that the mountain could support a small number of climbers, but if that number increased beyond a certain point, then the ice would begin to melt, as it was melting now. Soon it would drown the valley below and sweep everything away. This astounded us. The strangers had always told us that one of the reasons why they were so much stronger than us was that their ideas were universal, unlike the false local beliefs that circulated amongst us valley folk. All mountains were the same, they had said. They could all be climbed if only the climbers were strong enough, intelligent enough, resolute enough. That was what universal meant, didn't it? That all people everywhere could and should do the same thing. How could one refute something so self-evident? How indeed, except in the way the mountain had done it, without words, without reasoning with us? What to do now? As we were racking our brains, we saw that the climbers ahead had dispatched a group of emissaries to consult with us. Even though we could see that some of our former armed guards were in this group, we decided to meet with them to see if they could offer a solution to the problem. Our headman held a long palaver with them, but in the end nothing came of it. To our astonishment, we learned that most of the blame for our common predicament had been placed on us by our former armed guards. It was because of us, they had said, that this catastrophe had come about. There were simply too many of us to attempt to climb a mountain like this one. We were the latecomers, they said, so it was up to us to leave the mountain and return to our valley. But it was you, we protested, who said that all people everywhere must attempt to climb the mountain. It was you who said that you were the model we must emulate. All we did was to follow in your tracks. And it's a miracle that we've succeeded in coming as far as we have. For by the time we started, you had used up most of the mountain's resources. They shrugged this off. That's all in the past, they said. Why dwell on it? Let's talk about now. Look at us. See, we always know best. This is the time when you need to copy us even more closely than you did before. If you observe us carefully enough, you'll see that we are learning new ways to climb, so that we tread lightly on the mountain. This is what you must do. You must stop climbing the way you're climbing now. You must learn to tread lightly, like us. But there's no time for us, we cried. Our people in the valley, villages below are depending on us to climb as high as possible in as short a time as possible, so that they too can begin their ascent. You and, you and your people are already much safer than us because you're higher up on the slope. Even if you tread lightly, you're sure to set off avalanches that will sweep us away. We and our people will be doomed. But that's your fault, they said. If you hadn't been so slow in starting the climb, if you hadn't let the foolish ways of your ancestors hold you back, you too would have been higher up. Now you must accept your lot. It's your fate. And then we understood that there was no point in bargaining with them. We understood that the climbers who were leading them did not, in their hearts, care about the mountain at all. It had never held any meaning for them. What they cared about was being higher on the slope and proving that they were always right and we were always wrong. Nor could they even stop climbing even if they had wanted to. Climbing was like a drug to them. Their bodies could not do without it. And how, in any case, could they bring themselves to turn back? Their pride, which was very great, would not allow it. For it would have meant disowning their past and their ways of thinking and climbing. It would have meant admitting that it was not the manner of the climb that was to blame for our troubles. It was the climb itself. To hope for such a change was futile. And what of us? Could we have turned back ourselves? No, that too was impossible, for our bodies too had grown used to this drug, and to the thin air that we had risen to, and to all the excitement that accompanied our ascent. Nor would our fellow villagers have allowed us to turn back, for they were more desperate than ever, and were urging us to climb still faster. There was nothing to do then but to keep climbing, and so we did, but with heavy hearts now, for we could not forget that with every step we took we were advancing towards our doom. But once again we forged on even more frantically, and the gap between us and the climbers ahead began to dwindle. Soon we were so close that we could see their camps with the naked eye. 
And now, at this long-awaited moment, when we had almost drawn abreast, we encountered another shock. We saw why the gap between us and the other climbers had closed so rapidly. It was because they had stopped climbing. Instead, they were now using the materials they had found on the mountain to build armed lifeboats. These would suffice to carry most of them to safety when the mountain melted, but there would be no room for us on their vessels. Our headmen, if they were lucky, might be able to build a few boats from leftover scraps. But as for the rest of us, we, like our fellow villagers in the valley below, would be swept away by the flood. What to do now? In that moment of despair, we remembered our poets and storytellers. So much did we love their tales that we had brought a few of them with us on the climb. Now, with the slopes melting around us, we turned to them and said, sing to us, tell us stories anything that will keep us from thinking about what lies ahead. So now as we sit on that slope with the mountain melting beneath our feet, let's take stock of what lies ahead for our valley, which is in fact the largest such formation on the entire globe. Well, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've talked about some of the impacts of uh, climate change that are going to happen very, very soon in Asia. These are all catastrophic impacts. I think we all know what, uh, what's coming. But I don't have time, so I won't go, I, I, I'm going to skip that part. Those of us who've been at the forefront, those who have been so far in the forefront of the crisis, of the climate crisis, in the sense of being the best informed about it, are climate scientists and environmental engineers. These experts generally conceive of the crisis within the framework of a chain of cause and effect in the physical world. That is to say, as a series of feedback loops that begins with the escalating emission of carbon into the atmosphere. The solutions they propose typically consist of interventions within the chain of physical causes and effects. For example, by substituting solar energy for electricity produced by coal-burning plants, or by making improvements in the mechanics of water distribution, and so on. These solutions are often ingenious, and they might well have significant ameliorative effects. Yet it seems to me that the fact that this crisis is being addressed in this manner, if it is addressed at all, is but another link in the very chain of feedback loops that has created the problem. For in essence, the crisis is not technological at all. Or to put it another way, the feedback loop of natural impacts is embedded within a larger feedback loop that is, in the broadest sense, cultural and political. It is this larger loop that drives the natural impacts, not the other way around. To take a simple example, today in arid and semi-arid environments around the world, from Dubai to Arizona, Delhi to Casablanca and Sydney, there are hundreds and thousands of people who make use of public water supplies to keep their lawns green. It may well be the case that improvements to their hoses and sprinklers could reduce their consumption of water. The introduction of new varieties of grass might well lead to further reductions in those amounts. But what exactly will be the effect of those improvements? Will they actually save water, or will they merely encourage those homeowners to create bigger lawns? As long as green lawns continue to be regarded as a desirable feature of a home, people are sure to go to great lengths to keep them going. Can such issues really be addressed without asking such questions as, why should these people, whose ancestors have been content to expend their water thriftily on a single vine or a tree, feel that they need a lawn? What is the idea of the good life that underlies their desire for a patch of grass? In this sense, culture and the matrix of desire that it produces is at the heart of these issues. This is what we should be talking about when we speak of climate change, not about technological fixes, which are not solutions at all, but rather incentives that will only exacerbate the problem. In other words, climate change represents a rupture, not just in our environment and our history, but also in our culture. Every aspect of culture is implicated in this rupture, including our self-understandings, our desires, our arts, and our modes of expression. Nowhere will the consequences of this rupture be felt more severely than in Asia, which will feel its impacts with the greatest force. Nowhere does this rupture more urgently need to be addressed. A rupture as vast as this inevitably affects every aspect of cultural, social, and economic life. Here I want to think about one aspect of it, one that is of immediate concern to me, that is writing, and more specifically, writing in Asia. In an illuminating essay, the historian Dipesh Chakravarti examines some of the challenges that climate change poses to the writing of history and to the humanities in general. He points out that this crisis dissolves the distinctions between the natural and the human, 
on which the studies of the humanities is based in the Western tradition, a tradition that is now universal since it has come to be adopted around the world. Deepesh points out also that one of the corollaries of the distinction between the natural and the human it, uh, is that the notions of human agency and freedom have been placed at the center of the humanistic conception of history. What happens to these assumptions and to the writing of history, he asks, when we discover that human freedom is not limitless as this tradition has taught us? What happens when we realize that it is indeed subject to certain limits which are imposed on it by the planet we live on? This in turn leads to the question, is climate change itself a critique of the narrative of freedom? Finally, the page points to the centrality of ideas of consciousness and self-knowledge in the writing of history. What becomes of these notions when we introduce another protagonist in history, the climate, which does not share our consciousness and, and is yet guiding our destiny? It seems to me that these questions which Dipesh poses in the context of history could be posed with equal force in relation to art and literature, particularly in the 20th century, when, when there was a radical turn away from the figurative towards the abstract, when modernist, avant-garde, and postmodernist movements pushed nature to a greater distance from the human than ever before and made the ideas of freedom, agency, identity, and the exploration of consciousness central to every kind of aesthetic enterprise. Could it be that this turn in glo global culture is itself a part of the catastrophic convergence that has awakened that other protagonist whose dormancy we had always taken for granted, our planet? Well, I think I better stop there since I'm almost <laughs> at the end of my time. Thank you.